Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's very nice to actually see people here uh, come and listen to the talk. I know there's a lot of competition, so I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you made it here. Um, I'm a technical evangelist with AWS. That means uh, I go around, talk about technology. You know, traveling and talk, it's one of the hardest jobs in the world. Uh, so <laughs> I always say I'm actually the best job in the world. But nonetheless, I've, I've worked uh, about 10 years with uh, AWS technology um, from in various companies. And people like to either call us developer advocate, software engineer, technical evangelist. Whatever it's all, for us, it's all the same. What we like is code and showing uh, things how uh, how to build things. Um, today, I'm going to talk about two technology that I love: uh, serverless and, and AI. And especially like those because uh, you can build things very fast and experiment. You know, you got an ID, and you want to take uh, an ID to uh, you know out there very fast without investing too too much money. So we're going to talk a little bit about you know, what's AI uh, very briefly. And then we're going to go through about four demos. And hopefully those demos will allow you to uh, take things home and uh, maybe inspire you to try something uh, in your own business and see how you can apply. All right. So when we talk about serverless, there's uh, one paradigm that is absolutely fundamental. It's even driven. right? Uh, when we talk about event driven, we talk about having an event happening on uh, on B or A and triggering uh, C in that case, right? Uh, so it's very simple uh, and it's very natural. In fact, most of our daily lives is around event driven, but nonetheless, it's not the paradigm that is used very often or that was used very often. Uh, I think you're all familiar with. Uh, the classic polling uh, indefinitely for uh, status updates and things like this. Um, this is totally the opposite. Is that uh, you know when something happens, when a change of state happens, basically you notify the person, right? And basically uh, in serverless it works very well. And especially if you think about Lambda, uh, which uh, is our serverless computing uh, in AWS. Lambda is it was initially built. Uh, as a glue between services, basically, as a message passing between services, but not just message passing, really a message passing which you can run compute on, right? So basically, connect services together as event happens. So it's very easy uh, to stitch things together, right? And I'm going to try uh, to, to do this today with you. And if you think about Lambda in AWS, really, uh, it pretty much connects uh, all, all the service one after another. So if if you want to try something and if you want to have an experiment, uh, it's very easy to set up. And the good thing is, uh, because it's serverless, uh, you don't have uh, to pay for it all, right? Um, the classic use case, uh, and that we're going to see a, a little bit about this, uh, of event driven, and I think one that is very easy to understand, is say you have a, a storage, an S3 bucket. And then you have your user or your application uploading content there. Uh, basically, your state of the bucket is changing, which is then triggering event. And then that's the moment when you can hook a Lambda function to act on that data that has been put in the bucket. A very classic use case and one of the most used one is if you upload images or videos in this S3 bucket, then you do thumbnailing, you do metadata extraction, you do all these kind of things. right? So media companies have used this a lot uh, to index their content uh, without having a fleet of uh, instances of worker doing that. And if you have worked 10 years ago uh, and in, in that domain, uh, you probably know what I'm talking about. And of course, uh, there's always you know, people in the room that when we talk about serverless and that says, oh, there's servers under the hood, right? And there are servers under the hood, right? But that's actually, that's not really the point. What we mean and what we think about when we talk about serverless is really the fact that you can scale your application uh, without having to change uh, or do anything in the infrastructure. You push your Lambda function, your Lambda function will work very well for one invocation, but it will work uh, as well for thousands or uh, even millions of uh, invocations, right? 
because it scales as you use it. Right? So that's really the fundamental difference. Another one is that you don't pay for it all. Right? So because if there is no invocation, then uh, there's no uh, cost incur. Right? Basically, in Lambda function, you pay by the 100 milliseconds of invocation. Right? And of course, there is uh, fault tolerance built in because Lambda function as a service is built across several availability zones. So if there are problems, uh, there's always uh, redundancy in that. So basically, your service is highly available. And it fits exactly, uh, I think, uh, uh, in the, in the event-driven paradigm, because event-driven really means that if something happens, you want things to happen, right? And serverless is right spot on there. So you know, that's what we're going to uh, talk about today. And especially when uh, I love serverless and AI, because I think it's like salt and pepper. They really go together uh, uh, very well. You know, they make very juicy, uh, the food very juicy and very tasty. And that's the same, I think, for software. Uh, and if you think about AI, we've talked about AI for about 70 years, uh, really. Uh, it's started in the 1950s with the perceptrons and all this kind of stuff. But it's really with the advent of cloud computing that since that happened. Uh, if you're a little bit aware of AI, especially deep neural networks, uh, they take a lot of computing, right? Uh, they need an ex enormous amount of CPUs or GPUs to be able to, uh, uh, to, to be processed, right? To, to be calculated. And 10 years ago, it was simply not possible for scientists or for people in their garage to just you know, spin, uh, buy or invest in the data center that would cost about $10, $10 million simply to compute some, uh, some neural networks. Uh, with cloud computing, now you can simply you know, start 1,000 instances, uh, try your experiment, and shut everything down. Uh, so basically, when you look at the advent of AI with cloud computing, it really is a match made in heaven. The, you know, the, the, the second thing is, 10 years ago, there was very little data available as well, uh, especially data that you can use to train your network. Uh, and if you think about neural network, again, a very big uh, problem with neural network is they need an enormous amount of data to be trained, to be trained efficiency, right? And 10 years ago, there was simply not enough data uh, to, to do this. And again, with cloud computing, the, advance of, the advent of very cheap storage, it's very easy now to store all your data and then train neural networks for that. So basically, a lot of companies now have, have started to use AI simply because storage and compute is, is much cheaper than before. And of course, it's the same at Amazon. Amazon has been using AI for about 15 years. Uh, almost 20, uh, if you think about the first machine learning algorithm. But lately, you've probably heard about Alexa, which is our uh, home assistant, or we even experiment with drone deliveries and things like this. Um, the latest, uh, I think, very cool thing is Amazon Go, which is filled with AI in the shop. You just enter, pick up the food, and leave. There's nothing uh, that stops you. There's uh, no no one at no cashiers and anything. It's basically tracking you, text stuff, and then go. And all these are packed with AI. And in Amazon fashion way, what we've done is we've exposed this AI to consumers. So basically, nowadays, there's tons of AI running on AWS from consumer size. If you think about uh, Pinterest, Netflix, C-SPAN, or, or things like this. And whether it's a, a recommendation engine like Netflix or uh, more advanced, uh, yeah. Uh, systems, uh, they all are running on, uh, on AWS. So if we talk about AI and deep learning on, on, on our stack, it's really uh, made to fit the whole group of developer, whether you are um, pretty much like me, that you like to try things very fast, so you can go with ready-made service, stitch things together, and get uh, up, up and uh, and ready in a couple of minutes. Or if you like to do it yourself, uh, you can also start uh, AI frameworks and deep learning uh, Amazon image directly on the network, on, the, on your account, and start building your own neural network. Uh, I'm going to show you both end of the spectrum and go through some examples and things like this. All right, so let's first talk about uh, voice-enabled application. I'll put this uh, down so that we can, uh, we can start playing a little bit. The first one, the first service that I want to talk about is Poly. Poly is our text-to-speech synthesizer. 
Uh, the idea is that you give it a, a string, and then we compute voice-like uh, sound. Right, so a good example. Today in Seattle, Washington, it's 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Right, so you might see uh, that we actually fed the, the, the string today in Seattle, WA, it's 11 Fahrenheit. And Polly takes that context and note as we not saying out loud WA or 11F, we actually say Washington or Fahrenheit. So Polly is able to do this. But let's jump right in onto the, into the console. So this is the Polly console. Uh, so if you, if you want to look at it, uh, let me put this a little bit better. And there's about 40 different languages, uh, uh, voices in 27 different languages. So the, there's quite, quite a lot to, to, to play with. So let's play with some Dutch, for example. Hoi, my name is Lotte. Ik lees elke tekst voor die je hierin voert. Well, you can, you know, add, adjust your voice. And you can really, uh, for example, here, you say... Well, let's see what's saying there. I live from Devox. <laughs> I live, uh, so I'm live instead. But anyway, I live, let's say, in London. And we are live. So something like that. I live in London and we are live from a concert. Right, so we can, you can generate a bunch of voice uh, like this. That means that you know, the, the APIs just are, are very simple. Uh, you can make an API call with a, a, a string and then we return an MP3 or uh, a, a stream of voice. What it does as well, it supports markup language. Uh, so for example, here uh, I can uh, say to Polly that I want my name to be spelled uh, out loud. The spelling of my name is A-D-R-I-A-N. So we support, I mean, the markup language support a lot of stuff, uh, phone we numbers. We for the music live from the Madison Square Sorry. Garden. Right. Um, the spelling of my name is A-D-R-I-A-N. There's a bunch of different uh, uh, things you can do, like phone numbers, address, and things like this, numbers. Uh, so very, uh, very powerful. The API is super simple to use, uh, really, API, poly, and then you call the synthesized speech. Uh, and with your string. And then the voice ID is simply the voice that you can see uh, from, from the console here. So Russell or uh, things like this. So what can you build with that? Well, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can build, and actually customers have started to build a lot of stuff. Uh, do you know the application also Duolingo? Uh, some of you know that. Uh, Duolingo is an application that uh, allows you to learn languages. They are powered by Poly. Uh, so the entire uh, Duolingo application uses Poly to synthesize uh, this, the text so that you can learn from it. Another very good use case, which I'm going to demo today a little bit, is this one. So media companies have, for a long time, you know, tried to synthesize uh, their web pages so for people to read on the go or so for blind people to be able to consume. Right? It's not easy. Uh, uh, with, especially with mobile phone to consume uh, web pages for blind people. Um, so voice is a natural thing, right? So it fits very well uh, in that. And I'm going to show a demo there. And all the demos and the slides will be available on, on GitHub, so you can play with it if you want. But the demo goes like this. Uh, we're connecting an RSS feed uh, to, uh, to Lambda. And what does uh, Lambda does is we'll parse the RSS feed, and simply for each of the paragraphs, call Poly to synthesize uh, that. And then I'll store the entire thing into an S3 bucket, and I'll also compile uh, an XML file so I can play actually the, the whole thing inside iTunes. Right? So let's look a little bit at, at the code. So my, the code, uh, uh, the Lambda function is like this. Uh, Lambda function always has a handler. Uh, and here, it takes basically a new URL uh, uh, as uh, the event. Um, so a bucket and then a, a, a URL where I can extract the RSS feed. And I'm using feed parser, so it's a library uh, that basically goes through the feed itself. And then I, I create a hash of every entry so that uh, I don't have to reprocess uh, every entry, every time the Lambda function runs. And then every time I have an entry, I'm really 
calling, calling Polly and synthesizing uh, the, the entry. And then I store that into uh, an S3 bucket. So really, my code is a couple of you know, lines of code. Uh, these are uh, simply libraries uh, to be able to parse the feed. Now, when you deploy application, you have uh, a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, a lot of people use different framework. Uh, uh, I like the serverless framework, which is actually a third party uh, library uh, that supports uh, a bunch of things, but it supports very well uh, AWS. And this is how, uh, how it works. So I uh, just uh, create a service name here, it's going to be Podcast DevOps, and uh, mention the provider, the runtime, and then the timeout and then my region where the S3 bucket there. These are the statement that I need to say to, uh, for the Lambda function to access other services. So I need my Lambda function to access poly, to synthesize, uh, to synthesize the, the text. But I also need the, the S access to S3 bucket. And uh, you, you see there's also uh, X-ray. There are X-rays to be able to trace the calls between services. Um, is very nice if you want to debug your Lambda function. And then also create logs. What I also do here, and you see, uh, I'm using a Mac, so uh, Lambda function works on Linux. So uh, if you compile your library and your dependency in Mac, uh, in Mac you might have some problems. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm using Docker inside my Mac to, uh, to, create, uh, to create my libraries and create the package. So here, I just stipulate the, uh, the artifact. So basically, uh, the serverless framework will not zip the package. It will take the one that I'm providing here, OK? So let's, let's take a look here. So I've, I can show you directly in the console, because I've already uh, deployed it. Um, this is my, my handler here. And it has basically uh, uploaded the code. And you see my handler here is podcast on handler. Everyone sees at the end, right? It's OK? Good. Um, this is my timeout. This is the number of memory I need. And uh, that's pretty much it. Here I have an environment variable to just say the location of my bucket. Then what I can do, I can run some tests. I can configure some tests. And here you see I actually put an RSS feed. So this RSS feed is simply, uh, oops, sorry, wrong one. It's, the uh, analysis feed done by FeedBurner of the AI blog. Uh, so basically, you can access the entire blog in, in RSS feed. And these are things that I like to follow. Uh, the problem is I travel a lot. Uh, so I like to have it on, on, also on, on my phone and not uh, you know, read all the time. So Let's, let's run that. So my S3 bucket, you see here, it's empty currently. This is where I'm going to store uh, all the information. And I'm just going to uh, run the test here. So there's two ways. Either I can invoke the function directly here. Uh, so the, I can invoke my function. And I have a local event here, if you look at it, um, that actually has the same thing. And this is a good thing. What I, I really like with the serverless framework is you can invoke uh, and test your function directly from the browser, or you can put the test uh, there. But let's invoke from here. Let's hope the, the test gods are going to be with us today, because um, we have a lot of demos. So. And basically, yeah, it's already started to work. So it's, it's extracting the, the RSS feed and start uh, to compute all the, the different files. So there's quite a few. Uh, we're going to wait a little bit, uh, and then um, the last part uh, uh, of that is creating the podcast.xml, which basically has uh, the entire set of all the posts available, their address, and then is the one that I can open in iTunes. And this is exactly, um, exactly the same way that uh, Washington Post has done. So basically, they have Lambda functions that are scheduled uh, uh, every, every other hours to extract information from different part of the, uh, the, the, the news or uh, different blog posts, uh, and then uh, provide the audio files. And what they do is actually allow people to simply listen to the, uh, to the news. Uh, uh, so we're almost done. 
And this is very, uh, f f this what I like is, you see, uh, my function here uh, is only invoked when uh, and created when I need. Uh, I can create triggers here, for, for example. So if I would want to have a trigger uh, that does uh, an event, for example, uh, that creates, uh, to start every, uh, uh, every, uh, uh, every day at 12 o'clock, uh, I could put a cron job uh, type expression the same way as I've done that. So that Lambda function would be basically uh, launched automatically on the platform uh, every day at 12 o'clock. Cool, so we are done here, I'm sure. No, there's still a couple of files. Yeah, I deleted all the files before, so let's say it should be fast now. Come on. Yep, I'll warm up iTunes. Yep, that's the wrong one. Why is this one? So let's open, subscribe to a bo podcast. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's much longer than I expected, this blog. Uh, and there you go. So I have my podcast here. So the, what the, the framework does as well, the, the application, the serverless application does, is it transforms this S3 bucket as a server as well. So basically, I can use the URL uh, of that one and, and feed this into, into iTunes here. And what this will do, well, where is my, right, let's reopen this from scratch. At least you see I'm doing real stuff in real time when it doesn't work, so it's like this. Cool. All right. So here, I have my podcast there, and it's basically loading now all the podcast, and then I can start playing, uh, streaming them. New post. Author Derek Graber. Title, Understand Movie Star Social Networks Using Amazon Recognition and Graph Databases. Amazon Recognition is an AWS service that makes it easy to add image analysis to your applications. Uh, so, yeah, this is pretty straightforward and pretty fast to do things like this. So it's understandable that actually a lot of customers that starting uh, starting to use that very successfully. And really, the architecture is uh, dead simple. Uh, there's uh, uh, really nothing there. And in fact, it's really very easy for you to get started and and add some uh, extra uh, extra power to your uh, already built application. Another part that is uh, very, very popular, especially with AI services, is to, to do image analysis, right? Uh, and we have a service called Recognition, which was launched uh, last year. And what Recognition does is that you feed it an image or a reference to an image stored somewhere. And it can do object and scene detection. It can do facial analysis and return uh, face comparison. If you give two pictures, it can compare faces, faces between pictures. It can detect some celebrities. Uh, and it can also do image moderation. Another thing that is very powerful is if you have your own collection, you can tag people in there. And recognition will be able to detect those same people if you feed them the image of that pe person. So you can create your own uh, custom uh, collection. And now, uh, uh, Similar to, uh, to Poly, the recognition API is extremely that simple to use. Uh, here, uh, I'm using two, two, two examples, the detect, detect labels uh, that recognize, recognizes objects in the scene, or the uh, detect face. Uh, um, so let's do an example quickly. Oop. Oops. So I have a, um, an image of me that is stored uh, in S3, with, uh, which is a horse. So this is really uh, uh, detecting the label in that, uh, in that image. Uh, I'll show you the image, because I think it makes more sense. So let me go into my S3 bucket so that recall. Ah, so this is me in Iceland. Cool. Um, 
basically, if you go to Iceland, you have to try the horses, the Icelandic horses. They are phenomenal. They're crazy, but they're awesome. Um, yeah, so th this is what it returns. So I'm just returning basic labels, and you see a score uh, that is returned for every label, and basically that's a confidence score. Uh, so how people use that is, and quite common is they accept the label if it's above uh, 70 percent. Uh, so uh, I'm not saying that's what you should do. Uh, always assess the, the services and tools you are using, but nonetheless, uh, I've seen customers using this and they accept the 70 percent as uh, a cool stuff. That's a model, uh, that's a service that we train ourselves, right? Uh, it's constantly trained uh, with our, our own images. We never train it with customer images, um, and we always try to improve it. So uh, results that you get today might be different than tomorrow, right? Um, so how do you use this? Because it's so simple. So a lot of customers, of course, are starting to use that. Um, especially in the media space. Uh, so a customer uh, like uh, Binder uh, is using that to uh, tag all their uh, media assets and you know, being able to know what, uh, what they have in the image. C-SPAN has done something quite funny, is they extract iframe from videos and they send that to recognition so they are able to, uh, um, this, let's say, tag videos, right? So uh, what's in, in the videos? Every eight seconds, they do stuff like this. Another company in, uh, in India, Shadi, they use recognition for moderation, right? Uh, it's uh, the Tinder of India, you can think. And they don't want people to, up to upload trashy pictures, right? So what they do, they use recognition. And if there is some new details, things like this, they just discard, uh, discard the image. And it's very simple to use. Let's do a demo. So. This demo works like this, I'll show you. It's a bit more complicated than the other, but it's still very simple. Um, I'm creating a, a, a test, test app that is going to run on my laptop. It's Node.js app. What it does is connects to uh, S3 and DynamoDB. S3 is our storage, as you probably know, and DynamoDB is, an, is a database where we can, it's no SQL database uh, that, that you can use to store information. When you uh, put content into S3, it does an event triggering, and it, what it does, it triggers a Lambda function that calls a service called step functions, AWS step function. AWS step function uh, is a service that connects other Lambda function in a workflow, right? Um, and it works like this. So hopefully, yeah, it works like this. So uh, you have a start. And then you can, for example, uh, do sequential, uh, sequential steps. You can do parallel steps. So if you have uh, your workflow that is executing a bunch of things in parallel, you can, you can do it. Or you can do uh, branching steps, uh, which are independent of each other as well. And then you regroup all those results uh, at the end. The step function workflow we're using for this demo is that one. So the application takes an image, uploads that into S3. What we do, we extract right away the, the EXIF uh, metadata of that photo. Uh, we do an image check, so whether we, it's an image that is compatible with, uh, with our system. And then we store uh, the image data, metadata. And then we call recognition on every image to extract tags. And we also do thumbnailing. And then we add the tags that we've extracted with recognition into DynamoDB. And then we have our application that is able to, uh, to extract that information. So it works like this. This is, uh, let's call uh, user DevOps. I'll try. Uh, whoa. This, is the, this is always the hardest one, is to find names when you do demos. So let's call that demo super, super. Uh, uh, super great. And there, my application, I can start uh, uh, taking photos. So, well, that's not this one, not that one. Something a bit cooler, sorry. Uh, 
let's say that, for example, I'm uploading this photo. And in real time, you'll see now uh, also the invocations as they happen. So now the S3 uh, is being, the photo has been uploaded into S3. The step functions are being called, executed. So step function is really a state machine, basically, right? So that we, uh, we call. And what we do then, we create the thumbnails and then we add tags uh, there. So here you see uh, I, have, I have tags created. Uh, automatically, and this is super super useful for photographs for uh, companies that have image data banks and things like this that want to uh, you know tag their uh, their codes and, and create a simple application and really, this was nothing uh, uh, super complicated uh, to build. I can show you part of the code so here I have a bunch of lambda functions, so this is my uh, node. Uh, 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 Java, uh, my Node, Node, G, Node GS, um, JavaScript uh, Lambda function that uh, uh, basically add, rec uh, add the tags uh, from that have been extracted from recognition to uh, uh, to DynamoDB. You see, I have a, a database. Uh, then I just put the put the tags there. I have another Lambda function uh, that extracts the metadata here. All right, so uh, again, it's like a bunch of lines of code that you, you, you can, can reuse. You know, it's, those are, in, in a way, microservices that do very simple jobs, uh, one another, and then you can just tie them together. Um, and this is the Java, uh, JavaScript function that calls recognition, right? So again, extremely, uh, extremely, uh, extremely simple to use. Um, one line of code really to call the recognition. The rest is preparing the, the, the data. So this is how it works. It's, very, it's fairly simple to, to use. What you do is uh, you know, just uh, create uh, uh, your workflow using step functions. And you can do this with code. Uh, so it's a JSON file uh, that you can, uh, you, can, you can do. And here it is. So I'll show you that. This is my CloudFormation template to deploy the entire, uh, entire set of, uh, of, uh, of the demo. And it's available uh, on, the, on GitHub if you want. So you can have a look, uh, uh, look at it, how it works, and how especially how the, uh, the step function uh, flow works. So this is the uh, definition of the step function workflow. Uh, that has it happened. And for each step, I have a start at, which uh, gives me the uh, where, where to start after which uh, uh, step, and then I have a, uh, an, an end, right? So it's very simple to, uh, to code. Oops. Right. So another, uh, another cool thing is uh, that I want to demo as well. It uh, doesn't... Uh, doesn't need any lambda or compute. Simply uh, on S3, and this is this demo. So if you want to go uh, on the on that URL, uh, you can actually with your mobile phones uh, play with it, and you can access it as well. Um, so what it does is uh, you uh, can take a picture. So let's do it live. Let's take a photo. Whoops. So I'll actually, let's take a photo of the audience. See if the, it will detect something. Ah, cool, use photo. I'm gonna upload that, and hopefully uh, the oops, oh, the sound will work. So this, what it does is uh, calls uh, calls poly uh, calls recognition, extract information from uh, uh, from the images. <laughs> it didn't find any faces. So that's a great demo effect. Cool. Let's do another one. Well, I'll take my face. Ah, cool. Bit, oh. Let's see what kind of expressions I have. Uh, it's uploading the photo, calling recognition, detecting face. And let's see. So you can see here I look surprised, 57%, confused, happy. Um, let's see if uh, it gets to speak. Yeah, when there's the cable, it doesn't, doesn't want to speak for some reason. Uh, but if you try it on your phone, uh, this is going to stay up and sing live. Uh, so you, you you can play with it. I want to show you quickly the code. 
how that's worked because uh, it's, it's that simple. Um, first, I want to show you the architecture how this is built. Come on. This is how it's built. Um, I have a, a web page, an index.html that is in S3. S3 is our storage, but it's the, the cool thing with S3 is that you can turn this into a web server as well. So if you enable web, a website uh, for S3, basically, then you can use this as a, uh, as a web server. And what it does is, there's called three services. The first one is uh, uh, Amazon Cognito. Cognito is a ser an identity provider. Um, and here I'm using Cognito to give unauthorized uh, tokens, so unauthorized access. But basically, it means that you don't have to uh, give your login and things like this that anyone can can use. But it also means that I have very strict policy that that token can only call recognition and poly, and especially don't call anything else. Right. So I'm getting that token, and then I upload. Uh, uh, I send the reference of my data, of my image that has been set uh, into S3 to recognition, detect the label, detect the face, and then I speak. But I'll remove this because now the demo is done, so that you can. Hi, my name is Polly. In this picture, I see one face. Right. The first face is a surprise male between 30 and 47 years old. Well, that was me. I think I also see beard, hair. Head and portrait. Cool. All right. So yeah, you can play with it. Uh, I think it's it, you know it's just sh just to show you how easy it is to build. Uh, very even if it's a bit silly like this as a use case. But um, uh, I've done that demo a lot of time, and then uh, I've had a customer that actually said that they've implemented very similar things uh, for blind people. Uh, that take image every uh, every few seconds to be able to give a lot more context into what's around. Uh, so even though it's, it sounds silly like this, I take a photo of myself, but think about a use case of someone that used this in real time, right? Uh, um, so it's very powerful. Uh, another thing what I want to uh, talk is really uh, on the other side of the spectrum, right? Uh, so we have, uh, we have service that allows you to launch an Amazon machine, uh, an instance, like basically, uh, a full-blown instance, which uh, is called the Deep Learning AMI. And what it, it, what it does is it has integrated within this AMI a lot of uh, frameworks. Uh, frameworks like MXNet, TensorFlow, uh, Kernel, Keras, Cafe. Uh, so you can launch that in one click inside, uh, inside your environment. And I'll show you how to do this. And then you can start using it. So let's say if I go on to uh, EC2. And I can launch an instance. Uh, there's something called the marketplace there, and this is where we put our what we call deep learning, deep learning AMI. Uh, and then you have to select the Amazon one, and basically you just have to select and, and launch it. So I, I've done that already, uh, so we don't have to to do this. But then what you can do is something like this. Let me find uh, uh, here. So now my deep learning MI is launched. What I do is I just create a tunnel uh, uh, to it so that I can connect uh, locally uh, as well. And then I launch Jupyter. Uh, right. So then I can act access my Jupyter notebook locally. Here and it's like this. And what it is is really is really uh, really cool because you get access to all the frameworks uh, like that right away. And I'm not uh, and I'm not a deep learning or a PhD or anything like this. Though I still very I'm, I'm still very interested at being able to use them. So what I've done, what you can do, for example, if you go into MXNet, uh, you can launch some examples. And here you have lots of different examples on how uh, of the algorithm, right? So you can do some Bayesian methods if you want. You can do, uh, you know, Kapska, Kafka, or uh, Kaps, Kap, Kapcha, uh, things like this. What I, I think is very cool to play with is what's called the neural, uh, neur, uh, neural style. 
what NeuroStyle does is a deep learning algorithm uh, that uh, you give an image as a reference uh, and then another one to style, and then it will style uh, the second image based on the uh, initial image you gave. And here, yeah, this is what I love, is that you get access directly to the code, how things are done step by step, and then you can run it. So basically, this is my style image, uh, which I've provided, and this is the one that I want to, to style. I'm extremely bad at doing painting, so I have to use deep, <laughs> deep, deep learning uh, uh, to, to do that. Then you can you know, simply play and learn how, uh, how things work, and then you know, create your own, uh, own style. So this is really powerful uh, just to get started and, and learn uh, how things are. Right? You're not going to uh, do breakthrough, but at least I think it's a very, uh, very good way at the beginning to get started and then move forward. And as I say, you have access to all the frameworks uh, right on the, uh, uh, at your, you know, at your fing uh, fingers, uh, so fingertips. So you can do a TensorFlow, uh, you can play with uh, uh, a cafe and all this kind of stuff out of the box. Another cool stuff that uh, I, I like uh, I, I like to demo is this. So there's if you if you uh, if you are aware of um, of uh, mxnet.io, uh, basically it's an open source uh, uh, repository where people put their findings and what they've played with. Uh, and what you can do is uh, I, I don't know if you've heard about ImageNet. ImageNet, ImageNet is, a, is a library of images where people, and uh, especially in AI, have tried to crack down and, and for many years. So there's been lots of competition trying to compare algorithm to humans and how you tag and recognize uh, images. And only lately, a couple of years ago, uh, algorithms are a lot more efficient than human to annotate images. And so you can, uh, you can, uh, finally, you can actually access uh, all the algorithms that have been used uh, 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 to to do those uh, uh, tests. And people even have put their uh, models, so you don't even have to compute the models yourself. So, for example, here you see I'm using, uh, I'm looking at the ResNet uh, uh, algorithm, and you can start testing it with. Uh, 18 layers or up to 200 layers. Uh, 200 layers would take probably a couple of days to uh, to train, and here it's uh, it's there for you to uh, to use. Uh, it's a bit uh, a bit big, but something still that you can play with. So what can you do with that? Um, some use case that you can do, for example, with deep learning, and, and I think Stanford is one of the uh, great example that, uh, that of deep learning application is. This is a, an image of the back of the back of the retina, right? And the, basically, what it shows is fluctuation in the blood vessels in the back of the eye uh, can help you detect uh, a diabetes, right? Especially uh, diabetes, uh, a type of diabetes that is called by uh, blindness. And what they've done is, uh, for many years, it was it has to be specialists, and there are very few specialists around the world that are able to, to do that. And diabetes, as you may know, is actually not, uh, uh, isn't, is quite dangerous. So if you detect at the early, at the early age, you, you can prevent it. And what they have done is they've trained a neural network, a very large neural network, with images that have, have been annotated by specialists, and now they are able to feed images uh, wherever in the world to that algorithm to detect diabetes, right? Uh, so this is very, uh, very classic use case of, uh, of uh, using deep learning uh, algorithm to, to detect things. Another thing is uh, autonomous driving systems. So this is a company called Too, Too Simple. Um, and what they do, they use MXNet, a similar algorithm that you have access in the deep learning AMI. Of course, they are... Uh, They've tweaked it for, uh, you know, for, for themselves, but you can get started and, and try to understand. And what they do uh, is real-time uh, real tracking of, of cars, uh, especially for uh, real-time segmentations also of, uh, of environment, so, uh, so that autonomous driving system can work. So 
uh, I've shown you that there are, uh, there's a directory of a lot of pre-trained models that you can access here. And now the question is, how do you do this? Right? So a uh, very classic way of using this, uh, if you want to uh, start playing with it, is getting that trained model uh, from, from this repository and, and upload it into S3. Right? And then you can use serverless, uh, uh, serverless models to, to query your models. So in that case, uh, just for the demo, I've used this ResNet deep learning uh, algorithm. ResNet is basically uh, quite, uh, quite good at, uh, uh, at uh, detecting and labeling images. And it's been used uh, uh, a lot. The lambda function is in the, I can show you the code, but since I have the slide, I'll show you that as well. Um, it's also in GitHub, so you can access uh, uh, all that there. But basically, the lambda function calls two functions, which is predict and load models. Uh, load models take the model from S3 and then um, initialize MXNet and load the model in memory. Uh, since you are in Lambda, there is some limit in terms of the size of the model you can load. So it's 500 meg, uh, but you saw that the, the actually the 101 uh, layer model was simple, already 270 meg, so it's, it's something that you can use. And then the predict function simply use that model and then uh, to, to, to run a prediction. And you know, when you deploy that with serverless, uh, you can then you know, call, uh, call the, the endpoint uh, and basically uh, get prediction. So it's something like if you want uh, to train your own uh, neural network and, or if you want to use a uh, similar system than recognition, but actually being able to recognize things that you own your own things, right? It's something that you can do yourself uh, uh, like that. Of course, you would need to train the model, but then once your model is trained, you can uh, push it into uh, S3 uh, to, to be able to, uh, to use. All right. And really, the, the, the sense of, of this talk and the, the demos is just to show you that uh, AI is here, right? It's not, it's not the future. It's actually already today. And it's very simple. It's much simpler to use than people make it think. It is, of course, if you want to... Uh, compute your own model and, and, and tweak it and make it uh, and build an autonomous driving system yourself. It's not going to uh, uh, be a, a three-hour job. That's not the point. But if you want to understand and things, you know, get inspired of, you may, you may maybe start something new and enhance something in your business, give some functionality, voice or image analysis. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different services that you can use. Here I only demo three of them, and uh, we have a full spectrum of AI services that you can just use out of the box, whether it's machine learning uh, or uh, poly or recognition or Lex that is a bot uh, so that you can uh, use in real time as well to do conversional interfaces. Uh, on that note, uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, staying here first. Uh, there's very few people that left, which is great. Uh, and then uh, I'm happy to take, take some questions. And if I don't have time to take questions, you can always uh, ask me outdoor or uh, on Twitter or send me an email uh, directly. All right, thank you very much. Is there questions? I'm happy to take a bunch of questions. Cool. That's a shy audience. It's great. I was in Israel uh, two months ago, and I started the talk. And after three minutes, there's already ten questions. I didn't even start talking. There was already questions. So it's very different. It's cool. Anyway, if you are shy of asking the question here, I'm, I'll be outside taking questions as well. All right, thank you very much.